Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Alistair Burt. I'm the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Adelaide. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. Thank you for joining us uh, at tonight's Research Tuesdays event, Protection Against Meningococcal Disease. Tonight we will turn our attention to the largest herd immunity study into meningococcal B of its kind, the B part of its study. It's fantastic to see a study of this scale being undertaken and led by the University of Adelaide. It's a study which will have a lasting impact on our community and has the potential to influence immunization policy around the globe. And as you'll hear, literally thousands of adolescents participated in this study. And the lead investigator, Professor Helen Marshall, is here to share the preliminary results. Before we get into that, though, we're going to start the evening with a short video summarizing how Helen and her team went about the study. And following the video, two of our Be Part of It ambassadors, Jill and Oren Klemick, will share their personal connection to the study. And after we've heard from the clinics, I'll ask Professor Marshall to take the stage and to discuss her research. There will then be time for questions following Helen's presentation, so please hold on to those questions until the end of that presentation. So let's get underway. Um, let's first please enjoy the short introductory video and then welcome Jill and Oren. In 2017 and 2018, 35,000 senior school students from 238 schools in South Australia took part in the world's biggest meningococcal B study. The B part of its study focused on understanding the benefits of herd immunity by immunising large community groups. 711 school visits saw more than 55,000 swabs collected and more than 58,000 doses of the vaccine delivered to students across the state. Together, as a community, South Australia successfully completed the largest herd immunity study in the world and helped reduce the number of meningococcal disease cases in adolescents in South Australia by protecting them against meningococcal B. The results obtained from B part of it will be used in Australia and globally to assess the cost effectiveness of meningococcal B immunisation programs for children and young people. Thank you for participating in the study to help protect against meningococcal B disease and for being a part of something bigger. Hi everyone. Hello, I'm Jill and this is my husband Oren Klemek and we lost our son Jack uh, to meningococcal in 2009. Um, before that we were just an average happy ordinary family. Jack was 18 and in year 12, Georgie was 15 and Sophie was 12. We just had our 25th wedding anniversary and were planning, had planned a trip to the States for a couple of weeks and my parents moved in to look after the kids and for two weeks everything was perfect. And on our way home via Hawaii, where we were going to have a couple of nights, um, we got a call at night and uh, I noticed that the time of the call was four o'clock in the morning, Adelaide time, and I said, Doran, this is going to be bad news, and it was. Um, Mum said that Jack had just been taken to the hospital in an ambulance and they didn't know what was wrong with him. Um, and uh, then we started having phone calls from doctors saying, um, and each one was worse than the one before, and the words life support and meningococcal were voiced. And then we were told that we needed to get back home. Um, we managed to get on the only flight going to Australia that day and then had to endure a nightmare of 10 hours with no communication with anyone. So we didn't know what was going to face us when we got off the plane. 
Um, but in the meantime, Jack had played football on the Saturday. Uh, he'd been to a friend's 18th on the Saturday night and woke up on Sunday morning with a headache. And most Saturday, most um, teenagers of that age who've been to an 18th would wake up with a headache. It wasn't that uncommon. Um, but my mother, who was uh, probably more um, onto it than I might have been, uh, called a locum because the headache was getting worse. And the poor locum came and he had no rash, he had no symptoms other than general headachey, fluey symptoms. And the locum said it might be glandular fever, just keep taking the painkillers for the headache. Anyway, he went to sleep about 11. And so my parents went to bed. And again, like a lot of teenagers, he had half the kitchen plates and glasses on his bedside table from all the snacks he'd taken into his room and hadn't thought to take the crockery out. And he must have had a convulsion about one o'clock in the morning and knocked all these dishes off the bedside table and they crashed and woke my parents up. And it was lucky because um, they were able to get an ambulance and get him to hospital. And if they hadn't woken up, they probably would have found him dead in his bed the next morning. And our girls may have been the ones to find him, which would have been heartbreaking. And also it meant that because he was on life support, we were able to see him alive when we finally got home. So we arrived at the hospital and um, they said that he'd had a massive swelling in his brain and he was brain dead and that they had to turn the life support off. Um, we then had the discussion with the organ donation people and happily said yes, that was fine. Um, so this was the Monday evening and it had all happened on the Saturday, so it just happened so quickly. Um, so the next morning we said, goodbye and um, and that was that was it um, but we just feel so privileged to, to have been part of the be part of it um, campaign because even though next year is going to be Jack's 10 year anniversary of his death in May and we do cope much better um, but the agony of the longing for our darling boy, just never goes away. And if we can just, if, if another family doesn't have to stand by helplessly watching their child die because of this, it's just such a fantastic thing. So um, we're thrilled to be part of it. Well said. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to be here, actually. It's lovely to be in, an, in a lecture theatre that I've never failed something in. Um, <laughs> wasn't built when I was at uni, that's why. But um, the... Uh, Thank you, Jill. Um, we just miss him so much. And uh, I remember soon after Jack had died, um, through our friendship with Helen, uh, Helen mentioned that, uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but we're trialling a meningococcal vaccine, which has obviously all come a bit late, late for us. But um, <clears throat> as it developed, uh, Helen kept us informed as to what was happening. Thank you. And um, it sort of took on uh, a bit of traction. and. It's funny, I don't know, for some reason, Jill and I became spokespeople for, for meningococcal disease. Um, every time there was a death, we seemed to get a call and make a comment. And that sort of led to a little bit of uh, meetings with health ministers and shadow health ministers and all that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, just, I think Peter Malinowskis was really good in, in his role as... Uh, a health minister in the previous Labor government. And uh, I had a chat with him and he said, look, if we win power, we're gonna bring in this vaccine as part of our health system. And uh, uh, then I had a chat with Stephen Wade and um, Stephen said, look, not gonna promise it, but hopefully we'll do it. And uh, sure enough, the Libs won power and, uh, and Stephen's brought it in. So we're really thrilled to have played, I don't know, probably a little bit of a part of uh, a system that has uh, been the first state in Australia to uh, to bring in the meningococcal vaccine, the MEMB vaccine, for uh, our toddlers and soon to be adolescents as well. So it's really, um, I guess it tried, we, we sort of tried to, the agony of Jack's death 
you just try and turn it into some sort of positive, I guess. It, it's hard to do. It, it just agony. <laughs> um, just, yeah, just 10 years of yuck. And, uh, but we're doing good. And um, Helen, thank you for involving us in, in this study. Uh, it's just an honour to be part of it. It really is. And uh, congratulations on, on what you've done. So uh, we're thrilled to be here. And it's over to you now. Thank you. Good on you. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your story, uh, Jill and Oren. You really are an inspiration to all of us. I'd like to now introduce Professor Helen Marshall. Helen is the Deputy Director, Clinical and Translational Research in our Robinson Research Institute. And she's also Medical Director of the Vaccinology and Immunology Research Trials Unit at the Women's and Children's Hospital here in Adelaide. As mentioned earlier, uh, Helen is the lead investigator on the B part of its study, and delighted to welcome Helen to tell you a bit more about this. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Alison. Thanks very much, and thank you so much, Jill and Oren. Um, you know, we all miss Jack, and it's fantastic. You're just your contribution to the B part of its study, the ambassador role that you took on with other ambassadors. Um, the, just the communication um, has just been fantastic, so we really appreciate your involvement and continuing involvement. So, um, just um, so you, you're aware, I'm also an NHMRC fellow and a member of the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, which make, um, informs the Health Minister uh, on recommendations for immunisation policy for Australia. The B part of its study is sponsored by the University of Adelaide and funded by GSK, and they've provided the vaccines for the study. But there's no way you could possibly do a study of this size without strong partnerships. And I think South Australia is one of the best places in the world to do large population studies because we all get on, because we already have um, established relationships with SA Health. Um, we developed um, a partnership with our local government through this study, um, providing, because local government has the nurses that go into the schools to provide the immunisations. And that's just been a fantastic, strong partnership um, over the last two years. Again, education, so involving Department of Education, um, Catholic Education and independent schools have been absolutely instrumental at that executive level in encouraging schools to be part of this study and to give um, students the opportunity to be vaccinated and protected. As you heard, I'm a Deputy Director of the Robinson Research Institute, again, um, fundamental in really providing that platform to engage with our stakeholders very early on. Summary doing the whole genome sequencing, and I'll talk a little bit about that. SA Pathology um, received a record number of swabs, as you saw, over 60,000 swabs, half of those arriving over a three-month period, and I, they had their um, record um, number of swabs analysed uh, ever um, as part of the study. Australian Health Technology Assessment, um, establishing the database, doing the data cleaning and data, um, data analysis, and the Women's and Children's Hospital Foundation uh, supporting Meningococcal Cockle Research. But as you heard, I mean, Jack is my inspiration and Jill and Oren are my inspiration, and, and that's why I do the work that I do and why I try to um, look at how we can um, better uh, treat and prevent Meningococcal Cockle disease. So what about the disease? So it's caused by Neisseria meningitidis, which is the bacteria, and it can pre present as meningitis or septicemia. So meningitis, as you're probably more familiar, um, infection and inflammation of the lining of the brain, and septicemia is a, a blood poisoning. Both incredibly serious infections, as you've already heard. Um, we see about 150 to 350 cases a year, depending on, how, uh, on the fluctuation of disease, and I'll show you a bit about that. But it mostly affects children under five and then um, 15 to 24 year olds in the adolescent age group. And we don't know quite why, but in South Australia we have as much adolescent disease as infant disease. And that's unusual, not only in Australia, but overseas. Um, complications you'd um, also be familiar with, unfortunately, um, because of the, the way this um, disease affects the body, uh, we see um, lack of blood supply to limbs and digits, and that's where you see children um, in the media where, where they've actually ended up with amputation of their limbs because you get death of tissue and um, partial or full um, limb amputation has to occur. Um, deafness, blindness, 
skin scarring, and that shouldn't be underestimated because um, children sometimes need to go back to theatre 20 to 40 times um, to have a skin grafting for significant skin scarring, um, skin scarring at, um, from the disease. About 10% of people carry the meningococcus and most of the strains that are carried are actually harmless and they're transmitted. But uh, the hypervirulent strains, the strains that cause disease, um, are also carried and transmitted and we can't tell who's got the harmless and who's got the harmful strains. So that's why immunisation is so important. So just to show you um, some of these complications that you'll see there, um, with uh, Riley was admitted to the Women's and Children's Hospital and you would have seen, you know, he's ended up with partial amputation of all four limbs, um, which is obviously um, significant disability for him going forward. And um, this um, adolescent here who's going to lose some of that skin and, and have significant skin scarring. So um, I mentioned that we do see these fluctuations in disease and that's because we have um, hypervirulent strains that appear and emerge. Um, this is data from Australia over the last decade uh, and you'll see um, the number of cases. You'll see that most of the cases are this sort of rust colour which is the B. So B is really the predominant strain um, nationally but you'll see here we had this emergence of the purple and orange um, which is the W and Y strain which you may have heard about in the media and which has been more prominent in other states um, and hasn't really affected South Australia very much. You'll see this green colour too is the C and that's almost gone and that's because we had a very successful meningococcal C vaccine program. And that was introduced in 2003 and you can see there we've seen near elimination of the C strain um, which was again another strain that caused severe disease. This has now been replaced by a, a meningococcal ACWY vaccine so that's a combination of the four strains and that's funded on the National Immunisation Program because of that increase in W and Y that we've seen in Australia with one dose at 12 months for um, toddlers started in July this year and then for adolescents 14 to 19 years of age next year from April um, we'll receive one dose as well. So what about the B vaccine because we see a lot of B disease. Um, the B vaccine has not been included on the National Immunisation Program to date because um, when it was reviewed a couple of years ago, it was the um, cost effectiveness was considered unfavourable. But the PBAC at the time said, we need more information, we need to check that it's actually effective in a population program and we want to understand more about herd immunity. So um, the UK introduced a, a program for the infants and we know from that it's 84% effective. So good effectiveness in a population program. But, so this is the reason why we undertook the B part of its study to, to answer that other question about herd immunity and if there's a reduction in carriage. And, and, and as you know, we do have um, a program, as Oren mentioned, uh, in South Australia introduced just recently in October for infants and um, adoles adolescents to start next year with a catch-up program for toddlers and young people as well. So why is that? Why is South Australia gone for um, a MenB program and, and why is South Australia a good place to be doing a herd immunity study? Well, South Australia has the highest rate of meningococcal disease, as you heard in the video. And about 85% of our cases are due to B. And if you had a look on that graph before, you would have seen about 50% of cases nationally are due to B. In South Australia, it's about 85%. So most of our disease here is B. Um, and of those, about 75% are due to a hyper, the hypervirulent New Zealand strain. So there is a strain in New Zealand that caused an epidemic um, in around 2002-2003. They introduced a vaccine specifically for that um, epidemic and it went away. But we seem to have that, um, that uh, strain causing disease here in South Australia. And it's predicted um, that we've got quite a close match between that strain and the vaccine um, that's been implemented in our program. And you'll see here, just this is just a graph showing you this increase in number of cases in adolescence. Again, we don't quite understand why that is. So the aim of the um, B part of its study was to um, assess whether the vaccine has an impact on carriage of the meningococcus in adolescence. Um, and it's um, got three parts to it. Um, the pilot study I'm not going to talk about today, but that was uh, because we don't have any data on carriage in Australian adolescents. We uh, did a study in um, university students to look at what our carriage rates were like before we started. And then uh, the cluster randomised controlled trial, which is what we're about to um, tell you the results of today. 
um, which was comparing carriage prevalence in vaccinated versus unvaccinated students in South Australia. The third part, um, we're going back in again next year to measure carriage just to do swabs of university students to see what the impact of the school program is um, on carriage in, adolescent, in um, university students. So it was a cluster randomised control trial. Now this is a very robust um, way design. Um, and uh, when I've been presented, presenting this overseas, people are incredibly impressed that we're able to do this, uh, a study to this high standard in a large population, um, where schools are randomised to being vaccinated, students being vaccinated in 2017 or 2018, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, it meant that we wanted to offer involvement to every school in South Australia and include, um, yeah, offer the vaccination to year 10, 11s and 12, uh, students. Um, it, obviously easier just to do a study in Metropolitan Adelaide, but I didn't feel comfortable with restricting access to the vaccine just to make it easy. So we included all rural schools, all remote and very remote schools. Um, we, we needed to enrol students over a three month type period, three month period to um, assess the impact of the vaccine with everyone um, closely vaccinated um, over a short period of time. And students needed to have throat swabs done at day one and then 12 months later. We were looking at risk factors for courage and I'll show you some data from that as well. Um, so they needed to complete a risk factor questionnaire. Um, but one of the most important things about the study was that the students returned for the 12 month um, swab because we really needed that to be able to measure the impact of vaccination. So, um, Another good reason to do it in South Australia is because we have a very stable population with low mobility. And you may not know this, but um, South Australia has the highest proportion of year 12s applying for university in their own state. So that was good, particularly as we we're uh, measuring carriage going forward into university students. But when I'm presenting overseas, I say it's actually because no one wants to go across the border. If people want to stay in South Australia, it's safe. It's the only place in Australia that was a free settlement all the other states were, um, were settled by convicts and they get it. So um, what did we do to really get this um, study up and running? Well, it, mean, it meant we really need the whole state to be involved. So it was writing to get the support of the Premier at the time, the Health and Education Ministers, um, working with SA Health, with Anne Cole, the Director of CDCB, and Paddy Phillips, the um, Chief Medical and Public Health Officer getting the education um, sectors involved, as I mentioned, uh, working with local government and uh, with our councils. And this all really needed a very good, strong uh, communication strategy that was got, we were gonna be able to communicate with um, stakeholders, but with students, very importantly, parents um, and schools. So um, this was developed through a marketing public and public relations company. So um, university helping significantly with this and PPR and Cali Rose Communications. And hopefully some of you, did you all see the ad? See the, because I'm going to show you what it looks like anyway, if you didn't. Um, but it's about uh, raising awareness to be aware of, of meningococcal disease. At least be aware and know something about meningococcal disease. Be informed, be involved. We want you to be involved and be immunised and protected. So, oh, sorry, I'll just show you that. Um, I think I need to click on that. Um, Anyway, we were, anyway, I'm sure you, you, did everyone see it the, on TV? Because <laughs> I'm sure I can show it to you now. <laughs> so um, communication um, was very much about using a social media uh, strategy directed at adolescents and um, at parents. So I thought, you know, I thought adolescents use Facebook, but no, adolescents don't use Facebook. That's the parents use Facebook now. And um, so we used Instagram, um, Twitter, Snapchat, um, all those different social media, um, just to get the message across. And we had fantastic involvement from students, parents, teachers, um, principals of schools, um, helping us make videos uh, that would encourage people to be involved in the study. And of course, our amazing ambassadors um, making videos as well and, and uh, immunisation providers. So um, we, of course, to try and inform that um, strategy around social media, we. Um, enlisted the help from the uh, Women's and Children's Health Network um, Youth Advisory Group initially, um, so that the documents we were sending out would, would be as user-friendly and um, understandable um, using lay language. 
um, initially and then after 2017, because it was so important for students to come back, we really wanted to make sure we were getting the message across and we expanded our, our youth advisory group so that we were um, including um, students from all dem demographic areas. Um, just And they told us what worked and what hadn't worked in, in the first year of the study. So just more explanation around herd immunity. Um, they wanted laptop stickers uh, to put the date of their 12-month visit on. Um, they wanted competitions. Let's have a bit of fun about this. Let's have you know school casual days just to keep the awareness going about be part of it. So. Um, Again, you know, because this was really involving the whole state and immunisation providers um, who are working out in the community, we wanted to make sure that everyone was trained in study processes and everyone, it was fairly standardised that at least doing the swabs was um, standardised um, process. So we travelled to um, all these places here with the Blue Star just to um, make sure that people understood um, what was going on and what was um, required of them to be um, um, enrolling students and vaccinating and, and taking swabs. So I, I travelled in these little planes, hate these little planes, but um, you know we all survived all our um, travelling around to train, them, train the providers. So um, Aboriginal children have a higher rate of meningococcal disease and particularly meningococcal B disease. It's about 11 times the rate. So um, we wanted to make sure that um, all Aboriginal children had access to the study and to the vaccine. So we had a fantastic nurse, Adrian, who spent two weeks driving around the APY lands to make sure that she'd got to all eight schools, travelling um, a large distance to make sure that um, children had the opportunity to be involved. So what were we trying to achieve here? We wanted to measure the impact of the MenB vaccine on all strains of meningococcal um, disease that cause meningococcal disease, all strains um, overall, the invasive strains, individual strains associated with disease, um, whether you, um, the vaccine stops you acquiring um, carriage of the meningococcus, and also density. So um, it may matter um, how, how dense or how much of the bacteria you're actually carrying, carrying which um, could influence transmission. And then uh, we wanted to measure, of course, the impact on disease to see whether protecting against disease and measure safety of the vaccine in adolescents, because this is the largest group of adolescents to receive the vaccine anywhere in the world. And I uh, mentioned the risk factors uh, for carriage, and I'll show you those. So this is, I'm not going to go through this, but really just to show you the design. So um, we had over 95% of schools participate, which was fantastic. Um, and then they randomised for the students to receive the vaccine in 2017 or 2018. And in April to June, um, all Students then completed a questionnaire, had the throat swab taken, and then the students in the um, Group A schools uh, received the two doses. And then they all came back here April to June 2018, um, completed those questionnaires again, had the swabs taken again, and the students in uh, the B schools um, received the two doses of vaccine. So this is a questionnaire that's um, looking at risk factors. And we know from some of the, the literature and carriage studies done in the UK what some of the risk factors for carriage are. Smoking is a, a, a main um, risk factor for, for carriage, but also being in an overcrowding sort of situation, um, kissing, um, being out in pubs and clubs. So that's the sort of information we were interested in. It was completely de-identified. We didn't have names on it or anything, so I didn't have to feel that anyone was watching them complete this. Um, the swabs were collected on day one and 12 months, as I mentioned. They're, they're put in a special tube with um, liquid transport medium because they're coming from all over the state and had to arrive at the central um, SA pathology location uh, to be analysed. And so um, they're analysed straight away to see if they actually have the meningococcus bacteria. And then uh, at a later time point, the, the, um, the type of strain um, is determined. Their culture on these plates, so this is a, this is a bacteria growing from someone's throat um, in the study, and they're sent off for whole genome sequencing. So that's looking at the whole genetic makeup of the strain. So what did we find? So we were very, very pleased. We had, as you heard, almost 35,000, 34,500 students involved in the study and over 95% of schools. 
Um, another sort of incredible statistic to me is 97% of students receive both doses of the MenB vaccine. And you might think, oh, well, you know, why wouldn't they? But it's actually is a painful vaccine. And we know for um, HPV, for the HPV school program, only about 90% of them come back. So um, this is thanks to all the students who did come back, who saw the importance of it and also the immunisation providers. So that's a fantastic statistic. The other one is study completion. Now, most of us in clinical trials are happy if we get 80% of people back in a small study of 200. But to get 87% of students completing the study when you're talking about um, 35,000 is almost unheard of. So very impressive um, completion of the study. I think a lot of that is um, due to the communication. Um, so this is really just comparing um, characteristics of, of students in the vaccinated and unvaccinated um, group and all I'm going to say here really is that um, we have very low rates of smoking. Uh, so um, only 1.6% of students and maybe that's maybe they're too scared to say that they, they smoke but um, I think that probably does reflect um, the rates we have uh, in schools in South Australia and that's important in understanding carriage because if your smoking rates are low then carriage rates are likely to be low too. So this is the impact we saw on disease. So this is our rate, this is our adolescent cases going up. So this is the 20 to 24 year olds. This is the 16 to 19. So it's the green line that's the most relevant for this study. And then that's all of them. And you see this dramatic reduction. We introduced, um, so this is not months, this is um, ages of cases. Um, we introduced the vaccine and you see this dramatic reduction of disease in adolescents. Um, the yellow represents 18-year-olds, so 18-year-olds are our highest risk group for meningococcal disease here in South Australia, and you'll see that they've just disappeared um, from the data here. So great results. I've, I've included the infants up there because people might say, oh, I might have just gone down anyway, but you'll see for infants it didn't, it's, it stayed the same. So a really um, great outcome. And another way to do that is to try and predict how many cases you think you might have um, saved from the disease, and so this is doing a... a a plus one regression model and you'll see so this blue line here is the expected number of children um, and you'll see the expected was just about eight and a half and we had eight in 2017 but for adolescents the predicted was 11 and we only had six so we predict that we um, five less adolescents and young adults had meningococcal disease in 2017 and remember this is that's just 2017 we will do the same analysis once we've got to the end of 2018 but it could be somewhere between five and seven cases have been uh, prevented through this program. And I have a PhD student who's looked at the cost of meningococcal disease and um, the equivalent savings for those five cases is $1.6 million. And we don't know, we don't know what the potential is. We may have saved a life. We expect to save a life uh, from meningococcal disease every two years. So um, we would expect we will have saved one life at least <coughs> through the study. So the risk factors for um, carriage of meningococcal disease. So being a male is usually a risk factor for carrying the meningococcus, but we didn't find that in our study. We found it was equal um, for um, males and females. Um, as you get older, uh, your carriage rates go up. So for year 12, carriage rates were up higher than year 11 or year 10. If you've had a cold, you've got a higher risk of um, carrying the meningococcus. And if you've kissed somebody in the last week, you've also got an increased risk. Um, if you've been out to a pub and club in the last week prior to having a swab taken, you've got an increased rate of um, carriage. And I know this is not very good. This is supposed to be boarding students, but I don't really have, I couldn't find a, I couldn't find a good photo of boarding students. It's just, if there's lots of close contact in a household or, or living condition, you have an increased rate. Um, water pipes. Now, I don't know really much about water pipes before I started this study, but they're becoming more and more frequent. Can you imagine this passing this around between people? There's lots of opportunity for saliva to be transmitted around a carriage, and so there's quite a, a higher rate of carriage there. But the big one being smoking. So even though our rates are low, if you're a smoker, you have a, you, likely 15% of smokers are carrying the meningococcus and over double the rate. So if you just think about an example, if you're a year 12 and you're smoking cigarettes, you actually have over 11 times the risk of carrying a meningococcus and over 12 times the risk of carrying a disease-causing strain. So obviously the message there is don't smoke, but if you're going to keep smoking, please at least have your men be vaccine. 
So um, when we look at um, the difference in carriage at baseline and then 12 months later, what you're looking at here is the vaccinated and the unvaccinated group and at baseline and then 12 months later. And you can see for um, all, um, mening all types of meningococcus strains and invasive strains and individually, um, everyone did um, acquire bacteria over or the meningococcus over that time. Um, but you can probably see that um, in the unvaccinated group, it was a little bit higher than the vaccinated group for all um, meningococcus. So when we do an analysis and we take that baseline into account, um, what we see here is that um, for all strains of meningococcus being carried, there is a slight, uh, a lower um, proportion of uh, carriage, 4.3% compared to 4.9% in unvaccinated. But it is, it's about 15%, it's quite low, and it's not significant. If you look at the invasive strains, which was um, you know, an important primary objective of this, there is no difference. And if you look at the um, B, um, the B is the same, but why, interestingly enough, um, there is a reduction in carriage in the vaccinated um, carrying Y um, as compared to unvaccinated is about a 19, 20% reduction, but again, it's not significant. So safety of um, the vaccine, 38, uh, sorry, 58,000 doses um, were administered. We had an independent vaccine safety committee chaired by an expert in Sydney, and uh, we had very low adverse event reporting rate. Uh, anyone that had an unusual event, like an unusual rash, was seen by the Special Immunisation Service at the Women's and Children's Hospital, and there were no safety concerns or signals, ident safety signals identified during the study. So study outcomes, um, MEN-B vaccine is um, safe and effective in preventing meningococcal disease. And this is in the largest cohort of adolescents vaccinated anywhere in the world. Although um, we didn't see um, prevention of acquisition of carriage of all um, invasive strains, we still haven't answered the question yet about whether the B vaccine prevents the carriage of the hypervirulent strain that's causing disease here in South Australia. And that works ongoing and that relies on having the whole genome sequencing data available, um, which is not quite ready yet. I'm also interested in look at density, as I mentioned, um, but there are some um, other potential benefits of an adolescent program that you may not be aware of, and I'll, I'll just speak to at the end, around prevention of um, gonorrhea. So looking at the whole genome sequencing, this is just some of the strains. So within the B group, there are um, a whole lot of um, types of B or subtypes um, listed here by their um, genetic makeup. So this is actually looking at the whole genome of each isolate that is being carried. And what you see um, highlighted in the red and the purple are strains that actually are, are co cause disease. So, um, and in the shaded as well. So what we're trying to answer is whether we um, see a reduction in those strains, but you have to get down to the level of the genome of the, of the bacteria to really know whether you're having, whether the vaccine has an impact or not. So some of the un what I call unintended consequences of the um, program have um, been some really positive things. We've had parents who have never had their children vaccinated before have actually enrolled them in the B part of a study because they've, they've seen the benefit um, of um, the study and their child being protected against meningococcal disease. So they've re received their first ever vaccine as adolescents. Um, the, the engagement with adolescents um, in health decisions um, proved education around meningococcal disease. I've done about 30 interviews of, um, year, for year 11 and 12 students around their research projects. Um, it became one of the most popular um, subjects, uh, project subjects in, uh, to, in 2017. And um, just improvements in the school immunisation program with SMS messaging, um, which we were using to remind students. And, and uh, with that 97%, you know, getting two doses, we know, you know nurses were following students into um, juvenile detention just to make sure that they got their second dose. So it just went, just did an amazing job out there in the community. We know that um, there's already been um, international impact of our study, even though it's only two years since we started. Um, so the UK ha are doing their own carriage study now. And so we've shared our protocol and communication strategies. They're, they've called theirs Be On The Team. I think it's quite as good as be part of it, but you know. So um, we've also um, provided videos and protocols um, to um, 
researchers in Nigeria who are trying to do carriage studies as well. And the results are being provided to um, not only our Australian technical advisory group, but also the Canadian and UK advisory groups as well. So you heard we have a first in the world um, MENB program here in South Australia. And when I say it's first in the world, I know the UK started an infant program, but nowhere else in the world is providing it for infants, adolescents, catch up for children and catch up for young people. So we really need to evaluate this program. It's going to be essential and that information is going to be as important as the study really for um, countries around the world considering this program. It was based on direct protection, so it was based on identifying those age groups that you can see quite clearly here who have the highest rates of disease. Um, and so that's why it is such a broad program uh, of protection. I mentioned the possibility of um, MB vaccine protecting against gonorrhea. And this is some interesting new work that's been published recently. Um, in New Zealand, I mentioned the immunisation program that they had. What they noticed was um, a couple of years later, they noticed that there was a decrease in um, notifications for gonorrhea compared to other uh, sexually transmitted infections which were going up in the community. And, and so they hypothesised this might be um, due to the MENB program. And Neisseria meningitis, Neisseria gonorrhea, obviously they're um, similar species and they actually share about 90% of the same genetic material. So there's good reason why we might see that. They estimated about a 30% impact. So um, you may not be aware of the, of the, there is a rise in gonorrhea globally. The WHO have really called for um, research around this to try and um, protect against gonorrhea. But also um, there's a lot of antibiotic resistance causing problems with treatment for gonorrhea. And you can, this is the data from South Australia. It's just going up. Um, it's going up around Australia and globally. So if you have, um, it, you know, women and, and infants are really the one, those mostly affected infants. Um, can acquire the infection during birth and, um, and cause eye disease. Um, but if you have three infections of gonorrhea, then your risk of infertility is over 50%. So it's a really devastating um, infection. So we're planning, and I'm going to finish now, we're planning a partnership grant that will be a South Australian Northern Territory um, study to assess the impact of the MENB program in South Australia on meningococcal disease and gonorrhea, but also um, implement a study in the Northern Territory, very like, much like we have here with the Be Part of It study, providing MENB vaccine to um, 16 to 19 year olds. And again, in both state and territory, measuring the impact on meningococcal disease, carriage in the Northern Territory and gonorrhea in both um, with our partners. And we're hoping in some way that that will assist a bit, uh, a little bit at least in closing the gap to try and improve protection for Aboriginal um, children against meningococcal disease, as you'll see here in this graph, um, with the much higher rates, as I mentioned before. So I'm going to stop there and just say thank you all very much for coming along and, and listening to our results. And thank you to our, um, the, my co-investigators, some of whom may be here, I think. Um, you know, it's been fantastic working with them. Uh, and. The Be Part of It team, um, Susan and Pip and others from Virtue um, who've done fantastic work here. The, our International Scientific Advisory Committee, which includes UK experts in carriage as well as Australian experts. Our reference group chaired by John Robertson and with our youth advisors, which is just fantastic. Our immunisation providers out in the community. And I'm just going to finish off there with um, a video for you. As the Be Part of It high school study comes to a close, we want to thank everybody that's been involved. Throughout 2017 and 2018, 238 schools in South Australia took part. The Be Part of It study was set up to help understand the benefits of herd immunity through immunising a large community group. By being part of this South Australian study, you help drive global understanding around the protection of meningococcal B whilst also protecting yourself. The study wouldn't have been possible without the support and dedication of so many people, partners and organisations. Together we've vaccinated 35,000 high school students against this deadly disease. We want to recognise the community effort involved to get a study of this size off the ground and to make it such a huge success. It took you being involved as a participant, an enabler or a provider. Together we have successfully completed the largest herd immunity study in the world. And importantly we have helped reduce the number of meningococcal B cases in adolescents in South Australia. Thank you for being part of the world's biggest MenB study. Okay. So 
I'd like to invite Jill and Aaron to come and join me on the couch. <laughs> and if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Is it between you? <laughs> okay. Does anyone want to know how many takes we took to do that? <laughs> I was personally, about, personally. I was about 20. <laughs> that was terrible. Uh. <laughs> Yes. Thank you very much, Professional Marshall. That was very easy to understand. I don't consider myself to be very old, but I can't remember meningococcal being around when I was young. Is it a new disease? No. Um, meningococcal disease has been around for centuries, and uh, initially we sort of saw lots of disease where um, there may be sort of army personnel where there's lots of close contact. There were there was an increase in cases during uh, the wars as well where people were close together. It's very much um, a disease uh, where you do get transmission where people are close together. It's uncommon. And so, you know, when we're saying two per 100,000, it is an uncommon disease. But the problem with it is that it can kill in 24 hours. And so, to me, having a case fatality rate still of 5 to 10% in 2018 in Australia, you know, is kind of unacceptable in a way. You know, I think, I think um, there's not a lot we can do about it because, apart from immunisation, because even with treating with antibiotics, um, getting those antibiotics in, you can still die from the complications of the disease. So, if you... If, if you feel it wasn't around, it was, but it's, it was, it's uncommon. And I think, I think the other thing is um, you see these fluctuations over time depending on whether we have a hypervirulent strain emerging. I think South Australia is really interesting and I still don't quite understand our disease here because we have the predominance of that New Zealand strain. You do see that in other states, but not um, to the extent we have it here, which is it's causing most of our disease. The adolescence, um, again, is unusual. So it is more of a disease in infants and young children. But for some reason in South Australia, um, we have as many adolescence um, cases as infants. And a, about a third, of, a third of the cases nationally occur in South Australia. So there's lots we don't understand still. Shall I have a question for Helen too? So you commented in your talk that um, this work is important for understanding the economic benefit of using oh. the vaccine and particularly, I guess, for influencing governments and healthcare providers to think about using the vaccine more broadly. Could you comment on whether that's been impactful? Yeah, so um, I, mean, I think the, um, obviously the state program here, the evaluation of that will be really important, as I mentioned, um, as well as you know the results of this study um, to inform um, effect on disease. Um, we will also get more information from the Northern Territory around uh, impact on carriage in a population where carriage rates that we know are higher from our study here. Uh, so there are many countries around the world looking at whether they should implement ACWY, B, both, what ages. There's a lot of questions um, and there's a lot of information that we're missing. There's a lot of evidence gaps, but um, certainly this information about good protection for adolescents, no cases in anyone in the study, um, this, that drop in disease is really important. The um, impact on carriage is not there across all the invasive strains, but it will be interesting to see um, once we have the whole genome sequencing data, whether there is an impact on those hypervirulent strains. Yes. I, it's, it's in that I see that um there are two solutions, isn't it? Is that um, the vaccine solution and another one is lifestyle. What was that? Oh, lifestyle. Solution. Absolutely. A very, and, very important point. Exactly. So. Um, and you mentioned about the education. I think that uh, we need to go to a phase with uh, you know, the problem of human uh, problem on the lifestyle. I, that's why I just call the people to come to know Jesus, that is solution. <laughs> yeah. But <laughs> yeah, no, 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 but it is, it's really important. I mean, I think the smoking message, 
is the highest risk factor for not only for carriage but also for disease. So um, I think that is a really important message. Um, and you know, you could say, well, if everyone stopped kissing, going out to pubs and clubs, and lived alone, you'd be protected. But I don't think that's going to happen. So I think it's you know it's a combination of both. That's really know. yeah. Jack sort of ticked all. I hope he didn't smoke. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. No, I'm 99 percent sure he didn't smoke, but he had a girlfriend, so there was some kissing going on, and there was you, you name it. Yeah, had a cold. Had a cold. He played he footy, went out at night. He ticked all those boxes. Year twelve. Yeah. Year twelve. Age yeah. eighteen. Yeah. 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 Uh, to playing in a footy team, you know, all close and sweaty and sharing water bottles and mm. all that stuff. So. Yeah, he was a, a, a prime candidate. Yeah, can you assess the uh, ad relative advantage that comes to people by having been vaccinated as opposed to that comes from living amongst people where vaccination has taken place? So if you only had a certain number of vaccines, would you get more results from vaccinating everybody in a particular group or from scattering the vaccines as widely as possible? So um, the results from our study and from other smaller studies are suggesting you really need to vaccinate those at highest risk. So that's a really good question. It's, it's, it's really about um, protecting those that are more likely to get the disease. So it is very much about finding um, the age groups in your community that are at highest risk vaccinating and providing direct protection. And that, it's a really important question because some countries, they don't necessarily know what strains are occurring in their country and so that's where surveillance comes in. It's very important. I mean, SA Health do a fantastic job of surveillance. That's why we, we have all this data available about strains. But it's understanding in your own community, in your state or country, what are the strains, um, what are the age groups affected what vaccines are available? What can we afford? I have a question. Um, even though your data is about carriage and teenagers, and then you list the risk factors amongst teenagers, the only photographs you showed of, of youth with the disease are infants. Um, so what would be the risk factors separately for infants getting it? Yeah, no, good, good question. And I haven't, I didn't, I, I could talk for hours about this, but I tried to be a little bit selective. Um, that um, infants, and you saw that some of the cases anyway in infants, uh, it's the under fives and particularly the under ones that have the highest rates. So the rates, we talk about two per 100,000 overall, but they can be up to 20 per 100,000 in those under one year olds and particularly the under six month olds. And the reason for that is because they have a more immature immune system. So it's a, it's a different reason why infants get um, the disease. They just don't have the sophisticated immune response, um, so they're um, more vulnerable to not only meningococcal disease, but also pneumococcal uh, disease and other um, severe infections. Those photos of the infants too, um, covered in the purple rash. Jack had nothing, did he? He just had a little spot on his eyelid. Mm. So uh, it's very hard for the doctors to pick it up um, and you can understand why they didn't because just had a headache. So uh, yeah, but he mm. looked perfect other than a tiny, tiny little purple dot on his eyelid. So mm. not common. No, and it? I think that's the thing too, Owen, that um, it's, it is a kind of, although it's uncommon, it's a fear disease. It's a, a, you know, as parents we fear it, but as doctors we fear it because it is really difficult, can be really difficult to diagnose. The rash comes late, so you actually want to be able to diagnose it early. And it's, it, it can be um, confused with influenza. So the symptoms are quite similar to influenza, which is a much more common um, disease, obviously. So um, you're right, you might not have, you often don't have a rash. Um, but, you know, fever, unwell, um, may have a headache with meningitis. Um, or just be feeling generally awful, um, and then you know it's really an intuitive, intuitive doctor that's got to think meningococcal disease and do the right investigations and treatment. 
Well, yes, the vaccine is very expensive. Uh, can you tell us the nature of the vaccine, why it's so expensive, and will it get cheaper with mass production? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, the vaccine, and I didn't go into that in detail uh, because of time, but um, the meningococcal B vaccines, there's two vaccines that have been developed, and they have been developed in a different way to the other meningococcal vaccines, the meningococcal C and ACWY vaccines are called conjugate vaccines and they use the polysaccharide of the capsule of the bacteria. The problem with B is the B polysaccharide capsule, uh, polysaccharide in the capsule is very similar to a protein in our neural tissue. So um, even when they tried to do that decades ago, uh, they, there were concerns that you might get an autoimmune disease or um, that it, it wouldn't work. And when they did a few a trial, very small trials, they actually showed that you do develop antibodies, but they don't work because the body doesn't recognise um, the vaccine so much as foreign. So it's taken about 20 years to develop the meningococcal B vaccine in a different way. And what it, it has involved is looking at the outer membrane pro or the proteins in that bacteria that are really important for the virulence for that bacteria to survive. So they're in another layer of the bacteria. They've been identified as the most important proteins put um, in a vaccine. Um, for this particular one that's in the state program, um, they've used the outer membrane vesicle of the New Zealand vaccine, so they're quite closely related. Uh, so there has been a lot of work and development gone into meningococcal B vaccines. Um, the price, um, I couldn't really comment on, but the fact that you have to have more doses at a start, as a starting point is always going to make um, vaccines, vaccine programs more expensive. So with the ACWY, it's one dose. Um, from one year and, and older. With the meningococcal B, it's three doses um, if you start your program in infancy, and then for adolescents, it's two doses. So you already are getting more, a more expensive program for an uncommon disease. Good evening. Um, with the year 12 exams finishing and a large gathering of the uh, year 12, uh, it, I'm wondering whether either your program or perhaps State Health, and if you could comment on their behalf, of an awareness campaign that perhaps some of the lifestyle factors and transmission with both um, meningococcal B and then the flow on effect of the, with the gonorrhea. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really good point. And I would like to see the communication strategy, which I think has been fantastic, that's been developed for the study really continue and particularly with the state program so that people are aware and, and have that opportunity to be um, protected but you're right you know schoolies um, there'll be lots of people getting together and doing so, all sorts of activities um, that you know it, it's obviously good to be protected um, prior to that but yeah no I think education is so important because it's uncommon people don't haven't necessarily heard about it um, but we certainly hope to continue that communication with schools. The risk factors, so all of this is unpublished um, data that I've presented to you. It's very early. We wanted to um, share it with you before it's published. But once we have a paper, um, we'll certainly do a media release around the risk factors and everything. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I was just wondering how long the vaccination lasts. Yep, great question. So, <laughs> so at this stage, it, it looks like the um, protection lasts about five to ten years. Some of the um, studies are looking at long-term persistence. Um, we don't know whether a booster will be required. Certainly for the program here in South Australia, vaccinating infants, vaccinating adolescents, we really should see meningococcal B disease go away. That's what should happen. And in that sort of situation, it would be very unlikely that we would need boosters in the long term. Um, it would be hard, again, around cost effectiveness if we've hardly, if we've hardly got any cases left um, to uh, you know, have um, a positive recommendation around a booster, but no, it's a good question. Well, thank you all. Thank all three speakers, Jill, Oren and Helen, um, thank you all as audience for attending and your questions and comments. Um, that then concludes this evening's event, but also the 2018 series of Research Tuesdays. Uh, we're going to be back with another exciting and insightful program in 2019, commencing in February. So make sure you subscribe for updates via the Research Tuesdays website so you don't miss out. So thank you again for coming. 
Thank you once again to the speakers. Good night. Thank you.